think, um, Brendan, you can start the live stream. Okay, we're live. All right. Hello and welcome to the Wikimedia Foundation Community Affairs Committee Office Hour. I'm Cornelius, and I'm handing over directly to Jackie, who is our facilitator. Let me see where Jackie, there she is. Hello. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is the first office hour for the Community Affairs Committee, and we are so happy you could all join us and welcome to those of you who are watching after this has been streamed. So I will hand over to Shani to begin the uh, welcome message and for everyone to introduce themselves uh, who's here from the Board of Trustees. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening, good day, whenever this meets you. Um, I'm so happy to first be here, but also to be hosting the first office hours of the new um, board committee called the Community Affairs Committee. Um, this is an, an experiment that we're having. So please bear with us. We're going to learn from this experiment and um, we're counting on you to let us know uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, as you may have, um, as you may know, we have um, asked the community to send us questions in advance. Jackie will later on um, talk a bit about how this uh, office hour is going to work. But for now, I, I want to take one minute to introduce um, the rest of the trustees that are here and some staff that are also uh, here with us today. So as I said, I'm Shani evenstein Sigalov. I'm from Israel and I've been a trustee for over a year and a half now. I'm the chair of the Community Affairs Committee and I'm very happy to um, let the trustees introduce themselves quite quickly. So we'll begin with Isra. Do you wanna quickly say hello and where you're from? Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Isra El Shafi and I'm from Bahrain. Um, I joined the board in November 2017, a few months after I gave a keynote at uh, Wikimania Montreal that year about um, some of my human rights work. Um, I'm also the chair of the product committee as well, where we work closely with the chief of, uh, product officer to help assess and explore current and future product development efforts um, to continuously grow um, and improve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isra. James? Great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so James Heilman, I've been uh, on the board of trustees now off and on for six years. Um, and I'm a long-term Wikipedia, and I've been editing Wikipedia for about 14 years. Back to you, Shani. And James is the chair of uh, the Special Projects Committee, um, also very <laughs> modest. Is Maria with us already? We'll go. Hi, Shani. Can you hear me? She froze for me, I think. Um, but I can go ahead and, and introduce myself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maria Sefidari. I'm the chair of the board. I am from Spain, and I am one of the community selected trustees on the board. And I've been part of the movement for over 15 years now. Thank you so much, Maria. Is Nat here? Staff that is um, with us today. First is Amanda. Samantha, Hi, Hi Shani. Hi. Hello, hello. Can you unmute and just say who you are for those who might not know you? Yeah, hi, my name is Amanda <clears throat> Keaton. I'm the general counsel of the foundation and I'm also a member of the transition team. It's nice to see everybody today. Thanks, Shani. Thank you. Also with us. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, always also with us today uh, is uh, Margot. 
Marco, uh, can you quickly pop in to say hello? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Margot Lee. Um, I've been with the foundation for about two months. I work closely with the board. And I think we may have skipped um, Raju. Oh, um, I called him, but he didn't answer. Raju, do you want to pop in and say hello? Hi, Shani. I heard you call Nat, and I figured I'll take my turn. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Raju and um, I've been on the board for about uh, four years now. I'm in the audit committee and the HR committee and also quite involved with the our next uh, ED and CEO search as well. So I'm really glad to be here. And Shani, thanks for doing this. I know things are not particularly um, quiet at all in Israel right now. So really appreciate you doing it. And I also see uh, Frederick and Tito uh, and also Mayura on the call um, realize that things are pretty awful uh, in India for friends and family and all of that. So I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, the foundation has, uh, I think, about 16 staffers in India. So we are doing a lot to try to make sure that uh, they get some help and medical kits and things like that. Um, so I appreciate all of you joining from that region. Thanks. Peace and um, coming together and the stopping of violence everywhere. And of course, for people to get vaccines and uh, for COVID to, to, um, to, to be a bit, um, for everyone to be in a better place in terms of health. And um, so thank you all for joining. And I'm going back to staff and um, unless a staff member that I want to introduce is Mayor. Mayor, can you say hello? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mayur and I am the Director of Movement Communications. I'm new to the foundation and Movement Communications is a, a new team uh, in the foundation and hopefully we'll talk more about it later uh, during these office hours. Thank you. Thank you Mayur and Kim. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Kim. I work uh, these days on preparing board elections, also movement strategy, and community love in general. Thanks. I I lost Kim. Uh, I'm hoping um, Maggie is still here and that you can hear me. I am. Uh, Shani, the, the bad news I think is you may be cutting in and out for people and uh, somebody pinged me because it may be that if you turn off your background, it, your connection will be better. I don't know, but uh, hi everybody, I'm Maggie. I'm the Vice President of Community Resilience and Sustainability. Some of you know me already. Those of you who don't, I hope you will soon. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Unfortunately, Shani, I believe you're still cutting in and out and freezing periodically. Okay, I'm switching off my camera. Hopefully it's going to be better. Let me know in the chat if not. Um, I'd like to say thank you. Um, have worked for quite some time to make today happen. And uh, I just want to extend a huge thank you from all of us to them. And um, I'll cut it short because I, I'm not sure I'm heard properly. Back to Jackie for facilitating this event. All right, well, again, I'd like to say thank you everyone for joining us on this first office hour. And of course, technology, right? Um, likes, to, likes to give us grief all the time. I am Jackie Kerner. I am a board election facilitator and I'll be facilitating this office hour. The first 45 minutes will cover updates from the Community Affairs Committee and questions sent by the community in advance. The final 15 minutes will be an Ask Us Anything format with live participation. 
Questions will be asked in real time in several locations, YouTube, the Wikipedia Weekly Facebook group, the Wikimedia General Chat Telegram group, and the Office Hour discussion page on Meta. For those in the Zoom room, you may raise your hand using the feature or using the little function that I will put in the chat here. Um, there we are. So you can do that there. Now, in the interest of time, let's keep it concise. And also, I need to remember this myself because I am a native English speaker to speak more slowly because not everyone has the same comfort level with English. Now, before we begin, I have to share some boundaries for this office hour. We will not be able to respond to comments or questions that are disrespectful to people on this office hour, to staff, or anyone in our communities. We believe we can discuss things in a civilized manner and respectful way, even if we disagree on certain topics. That is something we will not compromise on. And also a side note, please familiarize yourself with the Universal Code of Conduct. Now let's begin. Will the CAC Community Affairs Committee commit to organizing its events across rolling time zones to ensure inclusion and diversity for contributors? Thank you, Jackie. Um, the quick answer is yes. We are committed to making this much more diverse and inclusive uh, than the first trial. Um, of different languages offering um, translation. We just want to make sure that we're not wasting resources. So for the next ones, we will be asking that people request in advance the language they want uh, translation for. And assuming we have at least five members requesting this, we will do our best to have live translations for these people. We're also committing to translate any um, communication, we, we, any written communication in at least more than English, right? A, a bunch of other languages. And I will pause here and would like to introduce you again to Mayur to tell you a bit more Thanks, Shani. Um, <clears throat> the internet problems, I think, uh, continue uh, a little bit, but I know colleagues are uh, documenting some of this. So if you're, uh, you know, struggling to follow, the, it, it will be written up as well. Um, uh, what Shani was saying earlier, and just to sort of, um, I said in my introduction, uh, movement communications is a new team in the foundation. Um, if we were a Wikipedia article, we're a stub uh, at the moment uh, and hoping to kind of uh, improve and build uh, as we go along. Um, and one of the one of the things we really want to do uh, as a team is um, think about how can we support equity in how the foundation communicates. And Ashani was saying, um, for example, you know, these office hours, they're an experiment to start off with, but we want to really work hard to try and make them more accessible to people. Uh, that means obviously across uh, time zones, languages, but also thinking about other ways we can help uh, people engage uh, in the movement and how we can create sort of two-way dialogue um, so that, um, you know, people can engage in a medium that's most comfortable to them. Um, part of this very practically, uh, we're hoping that um, starting in a few months time that we would have uh, multilingual staff based closer to the communities um, across different time zones so we can kind of scale up our connections um, with the movement. Another sort of small flavor of what we're trying to do to sort of make it more accessible to people uh, in different languages, et cetera, about all the things the foundation does is that uh, very soon we're hoping to do a series um, 
a series of sort of uh, short videos explaining what are the foundation's plans for next year, uh, followed by more opportunities like this where people can ask questions, they can discuss with the with the staff sort of responsible for particular areas of work. Um, and yeah, we'll continue the thinking, we welcome ideas. Um, and actually, a lot of these ideas are coming from uh, some of the focus groups that the movement communications team ran um, earlier uh, in the year. Uh, you can read up more about them on Meta, and we're hoping actually to be able to share um, some of the findings we had about like how can how can the sort of communications from the foundation help support the movement better. Um, very soon. Uh, so, so yeah, watch out for more from us. Uh, bear with us as this is an experiment and as we, as we kind of build and improve uh, things. Um, so yeah, uh, on the on the research uh, report, I can confirm it is actually with uh, translators. So we're, as hopefully you'll start to see, trying to live the. Uh, research findings ourselves and make sure that uh, the research is available because um, for those who might know about it the focus groups also invited participation in different languages so we had people participating in the focus groups in French Arabic etc so we want to make sure we translate the findings back into those languages so that we can check with the participants whether what they said uh, is fully captured so so yes uh, but translations do take time. So, but we are weeks away now. Thank you so much, Mayor. This is quite exciting. And um, I hope this will create um, um, Dear Shani, I'm so sorry. I believe that you've cut out again. Okay, with interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead on to question two. Shawnee, I'm sorry about your connection. Uh, the community tech team plays a vital role that is essential for community success. What is the plan to scale community tech to continue to be able to meet community needs as the movement grows? Thanks, I can take this on. Um, it's really great that people appreciate the work that the community tech team has done and acknowledge the vital role that it plays. The team has grown over the years. Um, when we started the team in 2015, it was just three people. Now there are nine people on the team, including a designer and a QA testing engineer. And uh, what the team uh, works on is determined by the wish list survey. So if there are vital tools that need support, then definitely let us know on the survey starting in late November. Um, we rely on your input to explore and um, to prioritize these needs. In addition to the um, community tech team, we've also got the anti-harassment tools team, which has recently um, been upgrading the check user tools and the blocking tools. Um, and a new offshoot um, of this team, the um, trust and safety tools is going to spin up in July. So, and, and that team will, um, you know, work on more projects related to user privacy and safety specifically. Later this year, we're also planning to establish um, a new moderator tools team with a broad mandate to identify and address the needs of experienced contributors on medium-sized wikis and help them adapt the tools and, um, and the processes that the uh, biggest wikis use. So we're going to start investigating these user needs soon. So if any of you at the office hours who have ideas and suggestions, um, maybe we can connect them with the, uh, the product manager. I'm sure it would be super helpful, um, you know, to find out what people think the biggest needs are. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we are re really relying um, and, and, and trying to keep the process open and inclusive um, of your feedback. Thanks. Great, thank you for that answer. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, now question three. When the endowment is big enough, 
would you announce to the cultural sector the movement has the funds to guarantee the survival of Wikimedia Commons and Wikisource indefinitely? I'll take that, Jackie. Um, even though the endowment uh, predates my joining um, as part of the audit committee, I have a window into that. It's a great question, right? Because the reason why the endowment was created was to get past this um, survival mode, which was dependent on uh, us kind of trying to raise money year over year. And we've been very good at it, but it doesn't mean that um, we will always be successful in reaching our annual goals. So the idea was to set up an endowment that's separate, which can where we can encourage some um, bigger donors to put money aside. And the idea was that it would generate its income once it's fully uh, funded. And that way we are balancing the annual asks that we go out and seek with this uh, stream of money that we can then cushion our giving. We'll never kind of walk away from annual fundraising, right? Because that's the bulk of what we do. Um, but the idea is that this would also supplement that. And when fully funded, um, the endowment will definitely allow us to ensure that a portion of the annual operating costs um, and needs for projects and missions, including commons and Wikisource, uh, would be funded. And I think the idea is to get us away from thinking that will this survive or not survive and to have some visibility into uh, how we can support it for a longer time. I never use the word indefinitely because none of us is going to be indefinite in anything. Uh, but in the foreseeable future, I think that is the goal to provide that support. Thank you. All right, thank you for that answer. And I just want to take a second and say that these are wonderful questions. So thank you to the people who reached out to submit the questions. And please, in the future, if you have questions, feel free to submit them. Um, this is wonderful uh, to hear these sorts of questions. So let's go ahead and go to um, a very common question that has been heard quite frequently uh, about meeting notes. Um, why are meeting notes only available from the audit committee and not all committees? I'm happy to take that one. Thank you, Jackie. Um, it's true that um, we don't really have a standard practice for publishing committee minutes. Uh, the audit committee, as Jackie said, does publish the minutes, but uh, other committees like HR or the private committee do not. Um, there are reasons for this. Uh, at the beginning of each um, year, uh, committee chairs uh, can make a determination on whether they want to, to publish or not. And, you know, it's, it's um, reasons uh, cited often have to do with uh, the ability to discuss issues free during the meetings, right? adding an aspect um, of uh, publishing and you know, a public communications aspect to the minutes, uh, it would increase uh, the burden of, of drafting and approving them. But I think that when we get these kind of questions uh, regarding you know, the, the publication of, of committee meetings, um, I think at, at the heart of it, uh, the deep question is how does the board or how can the board improve its approach to community communications? And that has been um, something we have been trying to improve upon in the last couple of years. Um, I think people have seen, for instance, in the last um, few months, how we've been trying to integrate uh, community input with the work of the committees, for instance, the, the BGC and the entire discussion and conversation on, on the um, pathways for, the, for trustees selection, right? Um, we're also trying with this kind of experiment with the community affairs committee and the office hours. So we're trying to get to the heart of the matter in a different way. And uh, hopefully this uh, helps us to try to um, improve transparency and engagement with the community. And also that you know, community members, just as the, the people who have joined today, uh, get to know us a little bit, a little, a little better. Um, get to engage with us and, uh, you know, see what we think and uh, just uh, interact with us. And I think this is one of those fantastic opportunities. Thank you. All 
I know, I think this is a great next question. Um, so how is the search for a new CEO going? And there's a second part to this one. So let's start with the first one. How is the search for a new CEO going? Jackie, why don't I take this, um, uh, even though um, several board members here are also actively involved in this process, um, I'll give a, a little bit of a quantitative and then a qualitative answer as well. So this was always going to be like a four to six month process, um, given um, the importance of uh, this search, given the global nature of the search. And um, I would say that about a month and a half in, it's going quite well. The reason I can say that is um, there's a lot of interest in the opportunity. Um, uh, Wikimedia and Wikimedia uh, both are seen as um, high impact and critical in these times. Uh, and so as a result, there's been a lot of incoming um, interest in at least wanting to have the preliminary conversation, get a little bit more information because we did put out a detailed job description, but obviously uh, candidates um, who are thinking of throwing their hat in tend to want to talk a little bit about it. Um, I would, I think the last count uh, close to 450 different levels of engagement and conversations have happened. Uh, we are in the process of like then kind of bringing that down to probably a few dozen. And then uh, within that, there'll be some more conversations to try to bring it down to a manageable number of people to then kind of get into deeper conversations. Um, uh, just the qualitative, just so that people get a sense of um, the profile or the nature of these uh, potential pool of candidates. We put a lot of uh, intentionality in connecting with leaders with deep experience in the global South. Um, as a result, um, I think the conversations have been pretty good. Um, Asia, Africa, um, uh, Europe, Southeast Asia, and uh, LATAM as well. I must confess and say we haven't really gotten any meaningful interest out of Australia. So that's one of the few continents where we haven't made much progress, um, though I'm not particularly fussed about that. Um, while it might seem not so to us, um, in the scheme of things, um, the foundation is a fairly large nonprofit. So a lot of the leaders we are talking to um, are coming from complex governance and stakeholder, whether it's volunteers or chapters environment, uh, these are people who have also been involved in global uh, somewhat policy work, not as much advocacy because we don't necessarily do a lot of advocacy. Uh, and many of them will still have some learning curves, right? We are not going to find the perfect candidate who checks off every single uh, box as well. We've also connected uh, with leaders in bilateral and multilateral and government spaces, um, leaders who have experience at leading at scale, leaders who bring a lot of good communication skills, um, a real understanding that the role here is to connect with the community and kind of um, be open to uh, absorbing what the community is saying and then translate that into making sure that we have the right resources. So it's a fairly complex nuanced search, but as a group, we feel pretty good about uh, the range of candidates that have expressed an interest uh, the early conversations are ongoing, and we'll continue to update the community um, and the staff, of course, um, as to, as uh, more of these conversations happen. Uh, but we are very much still thinking that the time frame that we had first set out, um, about six months, so maybe September, October is when we would um, uh, get to a point of like uh, having uh, candidates, but in between there's going to be plenty of steps and a lot of communication as well. Um, the good news for us is we are um, doing the search at a great position of strength. Our 20th birthday was like a significant uh, factor. We have the 2030 strategy in place. Obviously, a lot of execution and a lot of how we get there is still the opportunity and challenge. So we are finding candidates excited about um, the fact that there is a roadmap there's a lot of community conversations and buy-in into that roadmap. And people are looking forward to engaging with us to see how they can help us um, 
uh, take this forward. Um, so feeling pretty good about it right now. Thank you. Thank you for that that answer. That's wonderful. So many so many good conversations, and um, that's that's really great that there's a lot of interest and things are moving forward well. So here's the second part of the question: How will this affect strategy? This has been something that a lot of us have been deeply involved with uh, in the community, um, board members, staff members for many years now. So how will this impact strategy? I think um, as I kind of touched on it a little bit uh, in my previous answer, it doesn't, it doesn't, right? It doesn't in the sense that we are in such a strong place in terms of having a vision. Um, so much of this community conversations of the last two years have led to um, and I have a roadmap and a 2030 plan, uh, prioritization. Lots of these are continuing to happen. Uh, so in that sense, it won't affect strategy. Uh, obviously, um, having a uh, ED and a CEO in place um, means that some of the longer term decisions that we need to make um, uh, can also move forward, but very comfortable with where we are in the process um, uh, between the C team, uh, particularly Amanda, Robin, Jaime, um, and then the, the actual operational folks like Maggie and everybody else, it's business as usual. Um, and so in that sense, um, it is not slowing anything down. Um, and people we are talking to, people who are coming in, are coming in with um, their eyes open, right? That this role um, is, is about um, looking at what the community wants, looking at the vision and what we have set out and helping us get there um, in a meaningful way and supporting whether it's fundraising or technology, privacy, code of conduct, so it's more of a, a support function. So in that sense, I'm not seeing um, that this uh, transition affecting uh, long-term strategy as well. Obviously strategy is never static in the sense that a year or two from now, there'll be new challenges and new opportunities. So the ED and CEO will play an active role in that. Um, but uh, there's no, the, the change in leadership here uh, wasn't really about a change in strategy, right? It was just kind of a, um, an existing leader um, feeling like they've done a lot and wanting to try other things in their personal and professional life and us feeling pretty good about where we are and saying that um, uh, we can move forward and uh, let's begin the search for a new leader. So um, things are not going to be significantly different. Thanks. Great, thank you for speaking more directly to that. I really appreciate uh, your answer and I'm sure that others out there do as well. So let's go ahead and keep on movement strategy. There's um, a question about how much should we spend on movement strategy? Either James or Maria can take this one. I'm happy to take it, um, unless James wants to, to discuss. But sure, um, generally speaking, uh, movement strategy was about 1.6% of the total expenditure of the foundation since the work launched, uh, more or less hovering at around little bit above 1% the past couple of years. So since we began in, in fiscal year 1617 to fiscal year 1920, uh, it would be um, around 5 million um, US dollars. Great, thank you so much for that. All right, now there's um, been a question here about the progress towards creating a movement charter and a global council. Could someone speak to that? Can I interject, uh, and somebody slap me down if this is out of process, but I kind of like to say something about the, how much we spent on movement strategy and the increasing difficulty of measuring that. And now I've raised that, so 
Is, is that okay? Yes, Maggie, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, one of, I've, I've come up with my own little catchphrase because I like to do that. I'm starting to think of movement strategy as the water we swim in and the air we breathe. I mean, we agreed that this was the most important work to do for the movement, and it should really be just about everything we do. And I think increasingly, particularly as I'm part of the annual planning process for the foundation, I see movement strategy everywhere. Just all of it, you know, as we as we are looking at increasing funding towards emerging communities, that is movement strategy. So in many ways, I think it's going to become increasingly more difficult to say we've spent X on movement strategy because more and more movement strategy is everything. So sorry for the interjection. I just felt like it was it was important to potentially point that out. I will now subside some embarrassment. No, I'll call Maggie if I may jump in, Jackie. Um, I think from a board perspective, um, this is one of the most important things we will do. So um, it, it's never been a fun question of like saying, do we have enough money to spend against moment strategy? It's always been of saying, what does the moment strategy need to be articulated, get the word out, to get the community engagement? And I don't think resources have been a constraint at all and won't be, honestly, because it's the most important thing uh, we do. Uh, in coming years. So we, we could try to figure out a way to add up um, and do a lot of accounting and say this is exactly how much we're spending. But I think the another way to look at it is to say, does the movement strategy work need or have all the resources it needs? And I think the answer to that uh, continues to be yes, a resounding yes. Thanks. I think that those additional answers really provided more context. So thank you both for, for providing that. Um, so let's go back to the question that I mentioned uh, before you all had to add that content. What is the progress toward creating a movement charter and a global council? Maggie, can you please take it? I sure can. Uh, Shani, I know you're having trouble connecting, which is a pity because you did so much to make this happen. Um, okay, so this is a major commitment of, right, of the foundation and the community resilience and sustainability team over this quarter um, and moving very firmly into the next fiscal year, which begins July 1st. So the intention is to start doing the conversations around the, the movement charter drafting committee and how we can make this work happen. We, we're hoping that we will have a very solid understanding and cross my fingers, maybe even a start towards getting the, the drafting committee in place by the end of June. Um, that may be a little ambitious because time moves fast and it's already halfway through May. But as soon as we possibly can, we're hoping to have a drafting committee idea put together. And we're hoping to provide some support to the drafting committee through a professional consultant on what it is to craft a movement charter. And then we hope to have the movement charter worked on through the next parts of the fiscal year. We hope to be able to have lots of consultations with community about how this will work, about what ratification will look like, about how we make sure that it's truly representative of the broader movement and put together the global council based on the outcomes of that. I'm sorry I spoke too quickly. I get excited and I do that. If anybody needs me to slow down and say anything over again, please just tell me. Great, thank you everyone for these submitted questions and topics ahead of time. I think now is time, Shani, do you think to move next to the Ask Us Anything portion of the office hour? Yes, let's please do. All right, great. So again, friends, you may ask questions wherever you are, and that might, uh, we have people who are watching those channels. So for you, that might be YouTube, that might be the Wikipedia Weekly Facebook group. That might be the Wikimedia General Chat Telegram group. And that might also be on the office hour discussion page on Meta. Or if you are present in the room with us, you may either raise your hand or do this in the chat and we will get you in the queue.
All right, in the Zoom room, uh, nose bag bear, please. Go ahead, and again, let's keep it concise uh, in the interest of time, please. Will do. Uh, I did also just email this, so please remove that from that one. Uh, so my question is thus, um, how would the WMF uh, improve cases where a WMF team just fails to answer questions or indeed even refuses to say they won't answer it, uh, but the project continues. To give an example, the IP masking project has had pending questions of WMF Legal for well over two months, but our only point of contact is not in that team and it feels mean to keep shouting at him when it's clearly not his fault. Can I ask you maybe to phrase that question a little more simply, um, because we do have some uh, folks on the call who are not native English speakers. So could you phrase that a little more simply, please? Uh, okay. Um, so without example, how would the WMF handle just getting teams to talk to the communities when they aren't answering questions they've been asked? When, when they, the teams aren't answering questions that they, the teams have been asked? Uh, in this case, um, the team itself, the team running the, sorry, let's start again, apologies. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, the tech team is nicely communicative, uh, but the questions are of legal and they're waiting on legal and legal aren't answering the questions. Okay, so um, I, I'm, is it okay with y'all CAC if I take this one, even though I don't, I mean, what I'm actually going to say is beats me, but I want to say it a little more eloquently than that. So as I've been working at the foundation for nearly 10 years now, and I started with a job trying to improve communication between the foundation and staff, it quickly became obvious to me that one of the biggest challenges we had is that, um, staff are not able to answer questions as quickly or sometimes even as often as the community would like because they're they're working. Um, and that is not to say that answering community questions isn't important, which is why we have a whole bunch of facilitators who do exactly that. But I happen to have some insight into what the lawyers do and these people are pretty busy. So there's a lot that goes into when questions are answered and how and where they're asked. And yeah, Shani is saying in the side, we're hoping that the communication strategy will help having clear places to submit questions to and knowing who to talk to. So if, if a question appears on a meta page for a lawyer, for example, the lawyer being asked may not know the answer. They might have to go after other people to chase it down. They may have to consult. They may have to analyze what is legally risky to say in public. There's a lot of complexity to answering questions. Sometimes it isn't obvious to the people who are asking them. So, and, and when you add all of that, they also have contracts to process and uh, legal demands to answer from lawyers in other countries. It, it may simply be sometimes that we just don't have the systems in place for people to be able to answer in the timely fashion necessary. So probably I should have let Mayor handle this because the communication strategy may well provide a solution. Mayor, do you have anything to add? Mm, just to emphasize the last part of that point, uh, I imagine, yeah, uh, any responses, particularly of a legal nature, there might be things that they can't say and they can't say that they can't say and you won't know that they can't say that they can't say. So it's just, I, I can imagine with legal things, there are certain things that, so I, I, I think the answer to the question is in the question that maybe if it's a legal thing, then they can't say. That might also be, and I don't, I know nothing about this particular case, but I'm just guessing if it's a legal question. I would like to add to, to these two great comments um, that, Yes, sometimes uh, legal responses take time and they're not, they cannot be super immediate because there's a need to consult. But also, um, and I, I understand how frustrating it, it can be that it's been 10 weeks and that there's no response. Um, perhaps because of the times in which we are in currently, I would ask for a little grace. Um, there is 
th there are backlogs right now. We come from a very difficult year. And uh, the teams, uh, like everyone else in the world, have been struggling and trying to do their best. So I know that two months may sound like a lot, um, but it's it's beyond it being a legal question. Um, there, there is a human aspect there of asking for a little bit of extra patience in, in this particular context we're living in. I just wanted to mention it. I think to Raju here, I think to Shani's um, point as well, um, the CSC can become a additional layer if something feels like completely bottlenecked and no answer is forthcoming, um, good to flag the CSC and then we could see what, usually there are always good reasons for it, but sometimes it could have slipped through the cracks or something. But so I think that could also be an additional level of bringing a response back. Great, thank you everyone for those responses and thanks Nosebag there for that question. Um, let's go ahead and go on to another question that was received. Um, how much have we managed to adapt the strategy to, in regard to how the pandemic has come to change how we interact? So let me see if I can phrase that more simply. How much has um, the pandemic changed the way we meet regarding the strategy. I'm happy to take a stab at it and, and people can absolutely um, join their voices afterwards. The pandemic has affected how we talk and discuss about the strategy a lot. I mean, uh, we've, um, we, we've been a movement uh, that's been doing the bulk of the strategy work in meetings in-person meetings, in-person conferences. We met uh, to be able to discuss because oftentimes uh, a weekend in person can be much faster than a series of emails uh, over the course of a few weeks. And suddenly we cannot travel anymore and uh, we have to move online, right? And it comes with a huge set of challenges. Um, I know that there was a lot of Zoom fatigue at the end of last year when we were having the global conversations related to a strategy um, because it's, it's difficult to do many hours in front of, of a screen. Uh, the time difference uh, becomes a huge issue because you want to be as um, open and available to everyone. And it's really difficult to, to achieve because what, it's, what can be uh, 3 p.m. for a person can be 4 a.m. for another, right? It's been really challenging. We're not the only ones who have been facing these, uh, these challenges. And um, I think something we've been trying to promote is uh, how do we make sure that we can still have all the voices in the, in the conversations uh, that we don't lose people just because time availability has become an issue as well. There's less availability. People are going through a global pandemic. Um, time has become a, uh, something that's uh, pretty scarce, uh, particularly for, for folks in certain communities, right? Um, depending on, on which month uh, even uh, we were at, uh, there were certain communities that were more or less affected. Um, we've tried to move forward as much as possible so that we didn't come to a complete halt. The conversations have continued happening uh, but it's true that it has been a very challenging time and uh, trying to not lose voices, trying not to lose perspectives uh, has been one of the, the greatest challenges we've been facing. And also it, it also matters that, you know, we've been having these conversations as well in English, right? Happening as, exclusively in English. So we try to provide translation. We try to, to make sure that we're having the documentation out as, as soon as possible as well, so that people can, can uh, access it. But it's, at the end of the day, it means a lot of time. And again, that's right now, that time can be very scarce for a lot of people. So it's, it's been challenging. Just to kind of broaden that answer, Raju, again, 
it's not just um, the movement strategy and as james put in the in the comments i think it's affected everything i'll give you a simple example of some of the challenges which could explain um, why some responses might be getting delayed one of the great strengths of the foundation particularly for our tech team has been that you know we are mission driven you have high impact and you can work anywhere you want to that worked beautifully or as well as it could in attracting strong tech talent because we don't really pay the kind of salaries that tech companies pay because people could work in North Carolina, wherever they wanted to. But once the pandemic came along and everybody went online, every company out there said you can work wherever you want. So all of a sudden we are seeing significant challenges to our ability to attract people to kind of put against some of the priority projects that require tech. So in a way, um, it's affecting everything we're doing, some things for the better. Um, for example, um, even if we, when we go back to live Wikimanias, I think the ability for a lot more people around the world without worrying about visas and passports and travel um, can now join. So I think some kind of positive elements will come out, but there are other areas where we're going to be challenged in how do we attract and retain staff. And one of the core benefits of working for the foundation has kind of leveled out. So a lot of work to be done in taking the lessons from this past year and applying some good ones and trying to kind of see what makes sense and what doesn't. Thanks. Thank you for, for the answers. I'm going to go ahead and I'm sorry, I think I missed some, some questions uh, from raised hands in the room. My view didn't allow me to see you. So sorry about that. So I will go to Pharos and then we'll do, and pardon me, I don't know how to say your username. So I'm just going to go for it. Uh, Veer Spiel Checkers or Veer Spiel Checkers and then Chico. Hi, uh, Richard Nipel, user Pharos, coming to you from uh, Brooklyn by Brooklyn Borough Hall. Um, uh, I want to thank thank the, the staff and the board for working on the uh, on the board elections and thinking about it a little bit creatively uh, this time, um, and having you know the the consultants the consultation about different uh, different ways of approaching it. Uh, we had an approach that uh, sort of came up in one of the March meetings um, about having uh, support for uh, for board candidates and potential board candidates, um, and and the idea was of having um, thank you thank you Jackie for posting that of having uh, maybe some peer mentorship from board members or from former board members to uh, give some, uh, have to have a bit of a culture of invitation. So people who might consider running might talk to someone who served in the role and get, you know, feel that it's a real thing, feel that it's something that might be appropriate for them. Um, and I've, I've invited some people to participate and, and thank you to, to those who have. Um, and I wonder uh, if, if, if uh, some folks, especially the board members on the call uh, might be interested in participating and helping to have, you know, maybe short mentorship sessions with potential uh, candidates, uh, particularly trying to emphasize outreach to underrepresented communities. Because um, I do think one of the weaknesses of the elections in recent years has been uh, has been the candidate pool and expanding the candidate pool might solve some of the problem, if not all of it. Thanks. Okay, I believe that Shani has posted in the chat. In the chat, maybe her connection is not so good right now. Um, said that this needs to be discussed internally. We'll do that and get back to you. So let me just go ahead and go to rear spill checkers. Good evening. Um, I'm Jonathan, um, which can be pronounced as fair spill checkers. Um, question for for the board. Um, please, can we have a visual search routine on commons, i.e. a search routine where we can say, please, can we tell, show us what images look like this image, either of one that's on commons or one that's off it. So we can say, um, OK, we have a photograph of this particular building um, that we can't use for copyright reasons. Do we have one of the same thing on, on commons or something similar to it? Do 
with with where you know James Harlan here, you know, one way I have uh, personally addressed this issue is simply using Google Image Search. Um, and then, you know, you search for the image on Google, you limit that search to, uh, for images to commons, um, you know, .org, and then it will show you what images on commons look like the image you're, you, you've dropped into your search box. Whether or not we should build something like that internally, um, I, you know, I'm not a tech person, I have no idea how difficult that would be to build, or whether or not, you know, there's an open source, um, you know, open source uh, uh, software already available that does this. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if this is something we could uh, we could easily do internally. Thanks. I'll go play with the uh, the Google image search. See if that does what I want. Right, great. Now I'd like to invite uh, Chico to ask your question in the room. Hey, um, my question is a little bit more um, challenging, and I understand uh, we won't have definitive answers here, but um, I want to ask um, on Raju's point that he mentioned that more companies are allowing for remote work now. And one of the things that strikes me that would um, improve WMF's ability to hire people would be to stop the practice of uh, moving salaries based on the person's stay, uh, place of residence. So basically WMF pays very differently based on where that, that person, that staff or contractor lives. And so my question is, what's the board thoughts on that even after the pandemic and more remote work becomes more widespread? Uh, thanks Chico, Raju here. Um, to be honest, it's not the level of granularity that the board, this board typically gets into, right? Where our role is to say, um, ask the questions about, is there anything we can do to help um, if we are facing uh, challenges to staffing, retaining, asking questions about if the retention rates are falling uh, or if some priority projects are slowing and saying if the issue is people, then asking the question about what can we do to help? Is it a bottleneck of resources? But uh, happy, I think one of the staff members should take this idea back to Robin, um, who heads up our, uh, our talent uh, management. Uh, obviously, it involves making a decision that um, is long-term, right? Because these are decisions you don't want to make uh, on a tactical basis. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's a suggestion that uh, the staff can take back to uh, the TNC team. Thank you though, for suggesting a way to deal with it. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this first office hours and hopefully this will be the uh, first of many. We're going to go ahead and wrap up the recorded portion of this office hour and have a simple chat afterwards that's going to be just a more relaxed format. So please, if you are able, stick around, um, but this will not be a recorded portion. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll try to see if you can hear me now. Can you say if I'm Audible at all? You are currently. Awesome. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you again. This has been a long time dream for me to have this channel between the board and the Shani, I believe we've lost you. Perhaps turn off your video for this closing. <sighs> Can you hear me better now? Yes, there you are. We need okay. to incorporate some